Hey, great to see you. So glad you're here. And uh, before we get started, let's pray. God, we want to thank you, Lord, that we have a place to come and hear your word. And so we ask right now, God, that you would take away anything that might be a distraction, something that we've been thinking about that happened this week, maybe something on the drive over here. God, would you just take that away so that we can focus and spend this time with you away? Lord, speak to us into our hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit and tell us what we need to hear today. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, who's a parent out here? Anybody, some parents? Okay. Do you know that raising kids is hard work? Okay, you, you knew that already. Okay, you figured that out. Listen, there's so much that goes into raising kids, and a lot of it has to do with discipline, right? You have to take care of your kids. And so one of the forms of discipline, the primary form of discipline in our house is timeouts, of course, right? And we have two rules when it comes to timeouts. At least that's the way it started. The first rule is that the age that you are is the number of minutes that you get in timeout. So if you're three years old, it's a three-minute timeout. Four, four minutes. Five, five minutes, okay? The other rule that we have is that you can't be in timeout if you're crying, or timeout doesn't start until you're done crying. Because think about it. They'll cry for two minutes straight. It'll be over, and, t- t- and timeout meant nothing, right? So they had to stop crying, and that's when we would start a timeout. And this worked great when it came to our first daughter, Charlotte. Charlotte was an angel, okay? She, was just, she just got it. She, she knew. I mean, there were moments where she was a little upset that she was in timeout, but she would quickly stop crying because she knew, I want to get through those two minutes, those three minutes when she was little, and then get on with life, right? Let's just move on. And so she was good at it. But my daughter Gwendolyn, whole different animal. She's the second child, by the way, and it's true. The second child, I don't know what happens in that mix somehow. They just go off the rails. Like, they're crazy. Gwendolyn, when she first time she got a timeout, I think she was either two or three. We're going to say she was three years old. And she just, I don't even remember what the timeout was for. But I'm like, okay, you have to stand against this wall right here in timeout. And she is just screaming at me. No! I don't want to be in timeout. And she's going on, and I'm like, you're in, you're, in, you're I'm trying to put you, you never have someone screaming right in your face. I mean, it just drives you crazy. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna walk away from this one. I'm just gonna leave her until she stops crying. So she's standing in timeout. I don't know how long it was, but when I hear her stop crying, I walk up to her and I said, okay, Gwendolyn, now I'm gonna start your timeout. No, I don't want to be a timeout. It starts again. And I'm like, Are you, you got to be kidding me, right? And I'm like, and I'm like, please, if you'll just do that, it'll be over in three. Okay, all right. So I walked away, right? I come back again. No, I don't want to be a timeout. This went on. I'm not joking. This went on for 45 minutes. I'm like, it was a three-minute timeout, kid. <laughs> like, don't you get it? Like, I, I, but I couldn't break the rule. So then we had to start a whole new. Because of Gwendolyn, we have a third rule to timeout. And that is this, to save me and give me sanity. Timeout doesn't start until you ask me to start it. And you have to ask nicely. You have to say, Poppy, can you please start my timer? <laughs> because I'm not going to keep knock, coming up to the wall or wherever you're at and go, you ready for the timeout? No! Okay, I can't, I can't figure, I'm not going to do this. You just tell me when you want it to start. So my kids, when I put them in timeout right now, they stand there and some of them begrudgingly won't do the timeout. But eventually they figure the only way out is to get the timeout started. So they finally say, Daddy or Mommy, can you please start the timeout? So that's how it works. Parents, if you're, you have a young child, so think of that, right? Take the notes. You're probably going to need it someday, especially with that second child, Okay. The great thing, too, is because when they go into timeout and they're mad, they're rip-roaring mad before they start it, it gives them time to process this and calm down. You know, it just helps out, so it works. But here's the deal. Gwendolyn did not want to deal with the issue. She's in time. I don't, I don't want to be in timeout. I don't want to be in punishment. I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to be me. You be you. And that's how she wanted to deal with it. And she was going to resist me to the very end. Thank God I had seen the super nanny and saw that happen for, in that show where they did 45 minutes to finally get the kid to calm down. It happened in my life even though I didn't think it was going to happen. But sometimes we're a little bit like Gwendolyn. If you know it, we kind of resist change in our lives. We're like, we, we just resist it. We resist dealing with the things in our lives that we know we need to address. If I hadn't left her in timeout, she would have just moved on with her life. We resist some of these things because sometimes they're a little too painful. 
Like maybe it's something in our past and it just brings up a bad memory. Or maybe it's because of our own pride. I mean, I've seen that happen in my kids. It's like, no, I might be in timeout on the outside, but not on the inside. I'm not. You know, you know that moment that there's a lot of pride be welling up in there. Or we resist something because we just don't want to face it. I'm like, I, I don't want to deal with this. I'm just going to keep going and kind of pretend that it's not there. Or we resist something because we don't want to change. Or we fear what our new life will look like. What will this change mean in my life? Or there's something we just hang on to and we don't want to let go. And it's like, okay, it's time to maybe let go. And here's the thing that we don't often consider when we kind of ignore the thing in our life that we know we need to deal with. And it's the same thing that my daughter Gwendolyn learned. And that is this, that as long as Gwendolyn resisted the timeout, as long as we resist the change that God is trying to do in our lives, then we're going, never going to get to where we want to get to. Right? She spent 45 minutes in timeout. Some of us maybe have spent 45 years in a timeout, if you will, because we haven't dealt with something. It kept her from moving on. And that's the thing. The thing that we resist, the changes in our life, are keeping us from a better life. The thing that we've been holding on to. She's in timeout. She doesn't want to be there. Like, you could have done this in three minutes and been on to your life playing, eat a, eating a snack, doing whatever it is that you wanted to do. And for some of us, because we're holding on, we are resisting what God wants to do in our life, which is better than what we have right now. You see, sometimes we have the fear of confronting those issues or fearing getting rid of something in our lives. And we miss the fact that we're, whatever it is we're holding on to is holding us back. But it doesn't have to be that way for you and me today because we're going to decide to make a change, okay? And move on into the future that God has waiting for us. Now, we're in this series called Patriarchs, and uh, you saw the video for that. Basically, it's a study of the book of Genesis, really the second half of Genesis. Because the book in the Bible, what we're learning through the Bible, what we're learning in the book of Genesis is that the whole Bible is really about one man, and his name is Jesus Christ. Yes, he shows up in the New Testament, but he really begins all the way back in Genesis. In fact, we're going to see a picture of Jesus today in the story that we read, but it's more than that. The promises of Jesus coming, his lineage, his, his ancestry all begins here in the book of Genesis with a man named Abraham. You see, God came to Abraham and he gave him three promises. And if you've been with us, you probably know this. And there's a reason why I say this over and over again is so that it sinks into our heads. And so that we walk out of this un with this understanding of what the Bible is about. It begins with this promise that God gave to Abraham. He promised to give Abraham a descendants, uh, a nation that would come from his descendancy. And so we see that today as the nation of Israel came from Abraham and his children. And so that was fulfilled. And then he has another promise. He said, I promise as he brought him into the land of Canaan that you're going to receive this land. And this land has been given to them by God. And if you look at it today, Israel is there. Where in Israel, that's what we call it. And there is the land. Now, it's actually going to be a little bit bigger than that, but God has given that to them. And then he also gave them one other promise. He says, I'm going to bless you, Abraham, but not only am I going to bless you, and Abraham receives many blessings, but he says, I'm going to bless the nations through you. And that happened when Jesus Christ came and lived on this planet died on a cross for you and me to take away our sins, that all the nations would be blessed. And so he gave them these promises. Now these blessings and these promises were not just for Abraham. They were to be passed on. Because Abraham is not going to live to see Jesus' day in the physical flesh. So it's going to pass on to his son Isaac and then Isaac to Jacob. And that's where we find ourselves today with this guy named Jacob. Now, I need to catch some of you up to the story if you've been with us for the first time. So I'm going to give you a little summation of what happened. But Isaac, Jacob's dad, had two children. One was Esau and one was Jacob. They're twins. And when they're born, Esau is born first and Jacob is born second. He actually comes out holding on to the heel of Esau when they're pulling him out of the mom's womb. And he was called Jacob because that means heel catcher or deceiver. That's where he got his name. And so he... The thing about him coming out second, though, is that the elder got the better deal. You see, the elder was the one who got what was called the blessing. And so the blessing would have been passed on to him, but also the birthright. And the birthright was you got the lion's share of the inheritance. You were the guy who was over everything. And so that's Esau's position, and Jacob is behind him. But as I said before, Jacob is kind of known for being a deceiver, and he's constantly scheming to get what it is that he wants. And so one day, his brother who Esau was hunting and was really hungry, he comes off the field, and Jacob happens to be making some stew, and he trades a bowl of stew for his birthright. Now, I'm the one who's first in line. 
You know, and, and I don't know what Esau was thinking, but Jacob was like, I'm going to get that, and he figures out a way to get it. But then a second thing happens, and that is that his dad, Isaac, was going to bless Esau. But Jacob also wanted this blessing, and so he dresses up as Esau. Now, I have to tell you that Esau, Isaac, at that time, his father was blind, so he can barely see anything. And so he dresses up as Esau, disguises himself as Esau, and gets in, the, in front of Jacob, uh, excuse me, Isaac, so that Isaac ends up giving him the blessing, passing on the patriarchal blessing, the blessing of Abraham. All these blessings are going to come to him. Now what happens is Esau finds out about it. And when Esau finds out, he's rip-roaring mad. I mean, he can't even see straight, and he swears. He makes an oath, I am going to kill Jacob when soon as my father passes away. And so Jacob hears of this. He's scared, of course. So he runs away 500 miles away to his uncle Laban, who lives in Haran. And there he arrives and he falls in love with one of Laban's daughters named Rachel. And he makes an agreement with Laban to serve seven years in order to get the hand of Rachel. At the end of those seven years, though, at the time when he's supposed to marry him, Laban now tricks J Jacob and he trades Leah which was the older daughter for Rachel. And so when he wakes up in the morning, it's actually Leah. Now he decides that he's going to work another seven years so he gets Rachel. And now he's got two wives and he's got all these kids from those people. And so now he says, I've got two wives and then two slave girl wives and all these children, but I don't have any possessions. So he talks with his uncle Laban and he agrees to work with his uncle Laban. Now God ends up blessing Jacob during that time so that his possessions grow and grow and grow and Laban's begins to diminish, diminish, diminish to the point where Laban is now angry with Jacob. Jacob senses that his uncle Laban doesn't really like him, so he decides he's going to pack up his stuff and leave in the middle of the night. And he heads out in the middle of the night with all of his stuff and then Laban, when he finds out, goes and chases him to, the, to find him and get him, and he's going, he has bad intentions toward Jacob. We know this because God says to him, if you hurt one hair on his head, you're going to be in big trouble. He didn't say it that way, but that's what he meant, okay? And so they make a treaty, and they decide, okay, he catches up with them at the border, basically, of Canaan, and they make a treaty between themselves, and they, have a, they create a monument, and they say, okay, I'm not going to go past that monument toward you, and you're not going to go past that monument toward me, and then they leave. And then this is now where we pick up the story of Jacob. What is Jacob going to do? And so in front of him, or behind him, is his uncle Laban, right, who God had delivered him from, and in front of him is his brother Esau, right, who had swore to kill him. Now, that was 20 years later, and Jacob still has no idea how Esau feels to him. So this is where we pick up the story. This is Genesis 32, verse 1. So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And he called the name of the place Mahanaim. Can you, this is amazing, right? It's like, I've never seen an angel, and he sees a whole camp of angels. I mean, this must have been a very exciting moment for Jacob. But then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. So he's going to send some guys to go ahead of him to talk to Esau. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkey, flocks, male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord, there's the humility here, to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. Then the messengers returned to Jacob saying, hey, uh, we came to your brother Esau, and he's also coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. I'm like, uh-oh. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. I think I would be too. And he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two companies. And he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company, which is left, will escape. So he's kind of formulating a little plan here. Now, this is a fascinating scene that Jacob, as he's kind of there in the mountains of Gilead, in, finds, encounters this camp of angels I mean, it's like, I don't know what they look like. I don't even know how many there were, but that's a pretty exciting moment. Mahanim, which he, he names them, it simply means two camps. So as he's been traveling, he realizes there's been a, a camp of angels all along with me. 
I mean, that's pretty awesome. Like, they're traveling with you. I've heard stories from missionaries how they've seen angels or protected them, but this is pretty incredible. But it, all of this incredible excitement kind of vanishes away <laughs> as soon as he sends his guys into the land and they return and they're like, yeah, Esau's coming with 400 men. Now, to me, I'm like, could you not have given us a little more information, right? I mean, if I was Jacob, I'd be like, well, tell me what that means. I mean, was he, did he have a smile on his face or was he kind of angry? I mean, did they bring their swords? Are they wearing war paint? I mean, is this all they tell me? I'm like, come on, you went all the way there and you can't tell me if he's upset. But he's, uh, Jacob is scared. That's all he knows because the last thing he knew is that Esau swore to kill him. Now, when he was in the land of Haran at his uncle Laban's, before he left, his mother, Rachel, said, listen, go to my, your, my brother, your uncle Laban, and when Esau's like, anger has cooled, I'll send words to let you know. Well, he's been there 20 years, and he's never heard word <laughs> that it's been cooled. So think about that for a moment too, right? So he's there, and he's just like, this guy just wants to kill me. Now, Jacob is kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Because behind him is Uncle Laban, and I already made a treaty, and I said I wouldn't pass this stone to go toward him, so I, I can't really retreat. But then also, in front of him is Esau with 400 men, okay? 400 men is a lot of guys, okay? And I'd be like a little nervous at this point. So a Jacob was in this mountain called Gilead, which means rocky place or heap of ruins. So they made this this monument there, this mountain of rocks, but he says there's this kind of rocky place, this heap of ruin, ruins, and it's kind of symbolic for us. If you think about it for a moment, he's stuck in this moment, in this rocky place. He's stuck in this heap of ruins. It's like nobody wants our life to be on the rocks. Nobody wants our life to be a heap of ruins, and this is where he finds himself, kind of stuck in this moment. But the only choice for him to move forward means that he has to deal with his past. And so this is the first thing I'd like you to understand. If you have some out the outline, you can pull it out, follow along by filling in the blanks. You have to deal with the past if you want to move forward with God. If you want to move forward with God, you've got to learn to deal with your past. You see, Jacob was called by God to return to the land of his father. I put it up on the screen for you so that you can read it, but it was last chapter. He actually asked him to return. Go ahead and put the, the verse up on the, the board. Then the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and your family, and I will be with you. This is what he told them when he started the journey. When he, this was kind of the catalyst for him to leave Laban, aside from some other things that he learned. He's like, okay, it's time to go. God spoke to him. And so the land that he's going to, this is the land of the patriarchal promise. This is where you're supposed to be. Jacob, this is your future. Come and enter this area. So Jacob could have moved into the land, by the way. He's there thinking about it. Maybe he could have moved in by secret, right? Maybe I could kind of go on the DL. No, Esau's not going to know I'm there. I won't make any noise, right? I'll kind of be undetected. But I mean, that doesn't work out ever. When I was got, first got married with my wife, she moved into my house and she brought some other things. And one of them was a cat named Nemo, okay? I'm not a cat guy, but we had a couple dogs too. But Nemo moved in. And I had one rule for Nemo, because I wanted to be nice to my wife. I said, there's one rule I have, and that is that Nemo cannot sleep on our bed. I'm not sleeping with a cat, okay? This is not going to happen, not in my lifetime. So he wasn't allowed on the bed, and we kept that rule pretty good. Until one day, I went away on a four-day conference. And when I returned, Nemo was on the bed. What is this cat doing on the bed? Well, I guess he slept with me. And you didn't shoo him off. <laughs> so the next time I went to bed, what do you think Nemo did? He climbed up on the bed. And I'm like, get off. Every time I'd lay my clothes on the bed, I'd get up. Like, this is black, right? You put this down, it would be covered in hair when I picked it back up. I'm like, I don't want him on the bed. And every time I'd find him, I'd go, Nemo, get off, get off. And from under the pillow, you know, the, the comfort, I'd kind of like kick, not hard, but like nudge, 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 get him off, get him off. And he'd get up and he'd move. But he wouldn't really move off the bed. He'd just go to the edge and be really quiet. <laughs> no one's going to know I'm here. No one's going to know. And I'm like, get off the bed. I couldn't get him off. That was it. That was it. You see, he can't sneak into the land. Eventually, Esau is going to find out. He's going to have to face him. I mean, it's inevitable. And it's inevitable for you and me to face our past. At times, we have to face the thing that we don't want to face. We've been burying it. We don't want to deal with it. We just keep moving along from without it, thinking it's not there. But it's the same thing in life for us. It just kind of sits on the edge of the bed being really quiet. <laughs> like, 
still causing hair all over my clothes, all right? It's like I've tried to get rid of it, but it's not there. And some of us are carrying some things that we just go, yeah, well, it's just Nemo on the end of the bed. It's not really causing a lot of problems. It's pretty quiet, you know? But some of the things need to be dealt with. Not everything in our past. I'm not saying we got to go back and dig up everything, but there are things that we've been carrying along that we've known, that we've had to move on from, that we've had to get rid of, that we had to deal with, but we just kind of leave it there. And here's the thing. If, as long as it's in your life, it's going to keep you from moving forward in that area of your life. God said, listen, I have a promised land for you. I have your future. It's right in front of you. But you're going to have to come in here and you're going to have to face Esau. You're going to have to. There's no way around it. Maybe whatever it is caused you a lot of pain. There's like, there's this thing I know and I should be dealing with it, but it just caused me pain. And so I don't want to deal with it. Or maybe it's a habit. Like this habit, I just want to get rid of it, and I just sometimes I ignore it. I'm just going to move on without taking care of it or bad character trait. Oh, my gosh. How many bad character traits did I realize that Jesus pointed out in my life that I had to deal with? I'm like, oh, my gosh, I thought I was a good guy. I guess I'm not. <laughs> and so it's like these things that we bring up, and we can either decide to deal with them or not. Or maybe it's an attitude. Maybe we can put it bad that way. Instead of a character trait, it's like an attitude. We have a certain attitude in life. Oh my goodness, that's another thing. Keep continuing. And, it, it, and when you get married and when you have kids, it's like a mirror half for you, right? It starts pointing out these things in your life that you never really knew were there until you had to face them. Or a resistance to change or a grudge we're holding on to. I mean, there is a thing that happened between me and this person. And now, you know, I forgive them, but I never want to see them again. I forgive them, but I'm never going to talk to them. Like, Really? You know, and when we, every time we see them, we just can't help but say something and give them that little dig because we just keep holding on to that grudge or unforgiveness or hurt we just can't let go of. Or something in our lives that we've been told all of our lives and we embraced it at one point or another and now it wasn't true, but we're still holding on to it. A lot of us have that from when we were very young, a lot of times when we were first being growing up when we were most impressionable and someone said something, something did something in our lives and we've kind of embraced it and we know or at least it's there and, and God is maybe trying to point us to it so that we can bring it up, deal with it and then move forward. You see, all of us hold back something. I guess the question this morning is, what is your Esau? What is our Esau today as we've been kind of talking about this? The thing that we know we got to deal with but we still haven't dealt with. You see, we face, we have to face our Esau if we want to move forward with God. And you're not alone in this. This isn't just you alone or me, like saying, yeah, you guys got stuff you deal with. I got stuff to deal with. The apostles had stuff to deal with. Paul, the apostle, had stuff to deal with. Listen to what he said when he's writing to the book of Philippians. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have yet taken hold of it. I mean, taking hold of the full life that God has for me, like to be fully like mature. He says, but one thing I do forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He's like, I don't want the past to be holding me back. And, and he's not just saying, just forget about it in that moment. He's saying, we got to deal with that so we can move past so it's not holding me and restraining me any longer. He had it in his life too. I mean, this is the guy who wrote half the New Testament. Like this guy, if there was a guy that we say was pretty mature aside from Christ, maybe second underneath them or somewhere, like it's got to be Paul. He's got to be one of those guys up there. And he's saying himself to you and me, look, at there's all these things that you and I have, but the only way to move forward from our past is to deal with it. The only way is to take it on because you can move into the land, but you won't have peace. And you won't have peace in your heart or in your soul until we take care of the things that are inside. You'll remain in Gilead. You'll remain in the heap, the ruins, the limbo of your life until you decide, I'm going to face the Esau in my life. So here's what happens next. <clears throat> then Jacob said, O oh God of my father, he's starting to pray, okay? He's divided up the, the, the troops a little bit here, and now he's like, I, I think I should pray. So God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, you're the God of Abraham, you're the God of Isaac. Remember those guys? You made some promises to them, God. The Lord who said to me, return to your country, to your family, and I will deal well with you. We just read that verse. He's quoting it again. You told me to go here, God, and you said you're going to to be with me as he's praying, he's reminding God of the promises. I'm not worthy 
of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown me, your servant. For I have crossed over this Jordan with my staff. When I first came over this, this river, I had nothing but a staff in my hand. Now I have become two companies. What you, you, you blessed me. I was unworthy of it, but you did this to me. This is kind of humble position. And I don't know if he's just buttering up God or if he really means it. But he says, deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother and from the hand of Esau. For I fear him. He's just being open and honest. Lest he come and attack me and the mother uh, with the children. I love this. And the mother with the children. He's trying to say, remember God, the mother and the children, because those are the ancestry that you promised me, right? <laughs> like if, I'd, if the promises were come to me and a great nation is coming through me also, the mother and the children also have to be protected, even if you're not going to protect me. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for a multitude. So he lodged there the same night and took what came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 foals. And then he delivered them to the hand of his servants, every drove by itself, every herd, and said to his servants, pass over before me and put some distance between successive droves. So each one of these is a company going out in front of the other. And there's some distance between each one. And he commanded the first one saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you saying, to whom do you belong and where do you, are you going? So that when he meets the first one, he says, whose are these in front of you? Then you shall say, these are your servant Jacob's. It's a present sent to you by my Lord uh, to my Lord Esau, and behold, he also is behind us. So he's like, okay, the first one comes, he's like, what is this? What's the deal with all this? Well, it's a present to you. Okay, all right, maybe that'll soften him as he's going. Okay, he's got the, gonna give me a gift. So he commended the second and the third, or commanded the second and the third, and all who followed in droves. So he's like, every one of you do this. Go ahead, next. In this manner, you shall speak to Esau when you find him, and also say, behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with presence that goes before me, and afterward I will see his face, perhaps he will accept me. So the present went on before him, but he himself lodged that night in the camp. So the first one, he'd come to the first group and he'd be like, oh, these are for you, from your, from your brother. Oh, all right, maybe, maybe I'll forgive him. He's getting a little farther. Another gift, yeah, think a little more. He's getting to think about it. More gifts, more gifts, more gifts. Till he finally is going to get to Jacob, and he's hoping at that moment that he is going to appease his anger. But let's back it up for a moment to Esau's prayer. I mean, it's really, it's really kind of a great prayer. If you want to take note, I didn't put it in there, but number one, it was humble, right? He realized he's not worthy of the promises. I'm not saying I'm worthy, God. I'm just saying thank you so much for what you're doing. And it was full of thanksgiving because Jacob acknowledged the blessing in God's life. God, if it wasn't for you, I'd have nothing. I crossed here with a staff. Now I have a wife. I've got kids. I've got flocks. I've got stuff. And he says, you've blessed me. And it was full of God's word. I love that, that he's quoting back to God. And when we're in the moment of prayer, we need, or, or a moment of, of difficulty in our lives, it's good for us to quote back to God, not just to remind him, he already knows, but to remind you and me. Jacob needs that reminder. God, you promised you were going to go with me when you go into the land. You promised that these descendants were going to come from me, that that was the promise of Jacob. And in fact, it's a great prayer. But it's also been said this, the most important part of a prayer is what happens 15 minutes after the prayer. I'm going to trust in you, God. I'm going to do all this, right? He prays for the help. But then he puts this plan together, <laughs> right, to give, to, to try to sway Esau. Like, God, if you're not going to do it, I got my backup right here. So here's the next thing to know. The key to letting God go, or letting go, excuse me, key to letting go is to put your trust in God. I mean, we hear that almost every week, but that's so important. If we're going to let go, we have to put our trust in God. Because the only way you're going to trust God to work on that thing in your life is if you actually put your faith in him. You've got to let go. You've got to trust him with whatever it is. You see, Jacob, is, it's kind of telltale that he didn't have full confidence in God and what God was going to do because he had a confidence in what he could do himself. Here's what we're going to do. Got this great plan. Back to my old scheming ways. You're right. I got, I got to put this together so that when Esau, by the time he sees me, he's going to be like, 
crying because I gave him so much stuff, right? He's like, or praying that that will happen, right? So he gives a series of gift, gifts. If you count it up, there's 580 animals. I mean, that's a lot of animals. So it was a pretty good gift. Jacob surrendered his goats and his flocks in hopes that he was going to influence Esau. And what Jacob kind of didn't do was put his hope and his faith in God alone. Like, God, you can do this without me. Because we're going to, if God really trusted Jacob, think about this. Or, or, excuse me, if Jacob truly trusted God, think about this for a moment. He would have been at the front of the possession, possession, wouldn't he have been? Not the one, the very last one. I mean, I get through 500 animals, all your slaves, get through your family, and then finally you come. Like, he would have been, if it's God that's going to take care of me, he's either take care of me or not. I'm just going to go first, and I'm going to talk to my brother and deal with this issue. You see, but that sounds scary. Sounds scary to me. Like, I'm just going to go in there. Well, what if he just chops my head off and that's it? You see, God had given Jacob plenty of reasons to trust him. Think about this for a moment. More than once, God had reminded Jacob that he was the recipient of the promise. You're going to survive because you're the recipient of the promise. You have to survive. I mean, think about it. If I'm gone, then it's not going to happen, right? And he also told him to go into the land. And what did he say? I will be with you. I'm going to go with you. Also, last week, if you were with us, supernaturally, he protected him from Laban. Laban was hot after him to kill him or take away all of his stuff. And God says to him in the middle of the night, dude, don't touch him. Don't say a word, either good or bad, against him. I mean, God supernaturally spoke to his enemy and said, don't do it, right? This is Jacob knowing this. Also, when we started this chapter, there's a camp of angels there. <laughs> like, do you need to know more? right? The angels are here to protect you. Do you think Esau and his 400 men are greater than them? See, it's not easy, though, to face our Esau for either any of us. It's not easy to face that thing in our life that God is trying to pull out because whatever reason, maybe it's fear, like it was fear that led Jacob to look to his own strength. You see, it's pretty interesting, but we're going to see that this gift, this elaborate plan of his, is not going to make a difference at all in the reaction of Esau. It isn't. But he's like, I'm going to put all this together, all this effort, all this thing, so I can try to make it happen, and it doesn't even make a difference. You see, God already told Jacob everything he already needed to know. I've already given you everything you need to know. You don't have to make up a plan. You don't have to do all this stuff. And the truth is, what has God already told us? What has already God already told you about whatever it is that's going on in your life? I mean, if we go to the Bible, he's speaking to us constantly. Listen to what he says. This is for you. God spoke this to you. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? God says that to each and every one of you today. You have it in your program. Circle it, write it down, pin it up on a wall. The problem is we so easily forget this. I always forget this. But God has already spoken to us, just like he's spoken to Jacob. You see, it's not that there is no fear of a situation that you're going to, into, or whatever it is that we've allowed to linger into our life. It's not that there might not be a fear, but it's that we trust God with the outcome. And so we're able to enter into it believing he's going to deal with it. <clears throat> if you want to move forward in your life, you have to trust Jesus with whatever it is that you've been kind of Hanging, hanging on to. Christianity is not here to tell us that your problems aren't real. And I'm not up here telling you they're not real because they're not easy to face. Whatever it is, whatever our Esau is, obviously it was a big deal to Jacob. But Christianity is here to say that God is greater than your problem. That's what we have to realize. What Esau or Jacob didn't realize, or maybe he did, but he wasn't willing to trust yet, is that God is greater than his problem. God is greater than Esau. He can take care of it. And so we're going to finish now and see what happens and he arose that night, Jacob arose that night, and took his two wives and his two female servants. So everyone has already gone over. He sent them out. Like all his possessions basically have already gone before him. Now he's down to his little family and maybe a few servants, right? And he takes them and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford at Jabok. Jabok is the name of the river. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over what he had everything else he has and then Jacob was left alone so you guys all go across made sure they all made it and then he's standing there alone on the other side of the bank he still hasn't crossed over and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day now when he saw that he did not prevail against him he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint and he wrestled with him and he said let me go 
for the day breaks. So this guy's wrestling with him. It's like, hey, the day is coming. Let me go. And he touches his, his hip, and it just goes out of whack, out of joint. And he said to him, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So there's Jacob holding on to this guy. He was wrestling. No, 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 no. You're not leaving until you bless me. And so he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is that you ask me about my name? And he blessed him there. And so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, which means face of God. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. So his hip's never going to be the same again. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. So Jacob sends all of his family over the river. He's waiting on the other side, and he's just taking some time alone. I suppose if you and I would want the same thing. There's moments in my life I just got to get away from all the noise so I can hear from you, God. And there he is. He's spending time probably with God, and this man shows up and starts wrestling him. <laughs> like all night long. Like he's wrestling him until daybreak. And at which time he wants to go. He's like, hey, listen, it's daybreak. I need to go. And But Jacob won't stop wrestling him. So he touches his hip, it shrinks the muscle, and he can, he's out of joint, he can't wrestle him anymore, but he holds on until he gets the blessing. What is going on here? What, what is happening? Who is this mysterious man that shows up? Well, just to cut through all the fluff, the, 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 the guy who shows up is Jesus Christ himself. You see, in the Old Testament, there was what was called Christophanies. If you ever saw the angel of the Lord, sometimes called, or the image, physical image of God, it wasn't God the Father, but it was Jesus who showed up. So Jesus shows up to wrestle him. And even Jacob himself says, I have seen the face of God and I haven't died. Because if you ever saw the God the Father's face, it's too amazing for us. It says we actually die. We can't even stay in his presence. But we can in the form of Jesus. And so there he was. Jacob is wrestling with God. And here's the last thing for us to know. If you find yourself wrestling with God, it's because there's something God wants to change in you. If you ever find yourself wrestling with God, it's not because God needs changing. It's because God needs to change something in you and me. You see, notice it says the man wrestled with Jacob. It didn't say that Jacob started the wrestling match. No, it was God who comes to wrestle Jacob, right? Now, why does God want to wrestle with Jacob? Because he has something for Jacob. He starts the match. He's the one who wants to do something. He wants something from Jacob. We've all wrestled with God. All of us at some time have wrestled with him in our life. Uh, maybe we didn't agree with something that was written in the Bible. Maybe we didn't believe something or want to believe something about the character of God because it didn't line up with my morality somehow. God, I don't know how you could do this. And so we wrestle with these in these moments of who God is. Or maybe we resist something that we were supposed to do in our lives. We're wrestling with God. God's knocking on our heart, but we're still wrestling with him because we don't want to change. You see, when you find yourself wrestling with God, it's because the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. When you're feeling a resistance in your heart to something that God is speaking, it's because the Holy Spirit is there trying to lead you someplace. There's a saying that goes like this. If you take a stone and throw it into a pack of dogs, the one that yelps is the one that got hit. You ever heard that before? The one who's yelling, the one you feel that, that, that wrestling, it's because maybe the Holy Spirit just hit you with a rock because he's trying to get your attention. You see, God will sometimes allow us to wrestle him. Now, if I were placing bets, right, on this fight, I'm going to pick Jesus is going to win, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I don't think we ever out-wrestled Jesus. Is anybody a professional wrestling fan here? Anybody? Okay, a few of you. Okay, good, good. I'm glad you're like, okay, I'll go with that. I'll bite, Pastor, All right? Do you guys know that professional wrestling is fake? <laughs> okay, I should have started with that. You guys will fight over that, right? Don't tell Dwayne the Rock Johnson. I don't want him coming over and beating me up. But it's, it's scripted. We know who's going to win, right? It's, we already know the outcome. We know who's going to win this fight when it comes to Jacob and Jesus. I mean, Jesus does what I do with my kids. We bought a king-size bed, and we wrestle almost every day. Yesterday, yesterday, because it was Saturday, I think we had two or three wrestling bouts on our bed, the king-size bed. 
and, and so they'll jump on me, and we'll fight. And Woody, oh my gosh, sometimes he doesn't hold back. He jumps up full weight to, with his knees and lands right on my ribs. I mean, that is painful. We're working on that one, okay, because he's getting heavier. And we will fight and wrestle, and I'll throw him around. Even the girls get into it. Gwenny is the sweet princess who kind of just gets there because she wants to be part of it all. But here's what happens. I, I just match their strength, right? I, I mean, I could take them out. Don't tell them that. But I could just take them out real easy because they're so much smaller than me. One day, Woody's going to take me out. I don't, I'm not looking forward to that day. He's going to get bigger than me. But right now, what do I do? I don't just destroy them. I don't pick them up and spotty slam them, throw them off the bed. Ha! Defeated you, right? I match their strength just enough so that we're wrestling together and that we're at the same length. I don't know if Jacob knew who he was wrestling with at first. Right? He starts wrestling with this guy. I don't know if he knew that in the moment. But the more he wrestled, right, the more he must have realized, I'm not going to win. I, I'm not going to win this. I don't know. Has anyone ever wrestled or fought with somebody before? I mean, physically fought? It is exhausting. Right? It is exhausting. That's why a boxing round is only like three to five minutes. Or WWE or whatever. Uh, world, no, uh, I can't think of the name. <laughs> MMA, thank you. MMA fighting, they're three minute, three, they're three, three minute rounds because you're grappling, you're exhausted after three minutes. This guy went all night long. Let's say it was a short night, four hours. Four to eight hours, just constantly wrestling. I mean, this guy had strength inside. Jacob does it all night long. He finds himself wrestling with God, resisting the work that God wants to do in his life. You see, the apostle Paul was the same way. Just like you and me. There's something in our lives that we're wrestling against. Listen to what Paul says, or Jesus says to Paul. This is the moment of Paul's conversion. Because Paul didn't want to recognize Jesus. He was religious like crazy. He was, had a heart after God. I mean, he was a fanatic about protecting the, the dignity of God. And all along, God is trying to get his attention Jesus is the one I want you to be fanatic about. Listen to what he says. When he falls to the ground, he sees a great light on his way to Damascus, falls off his horse. He says, we fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Is it hard for you to kick against the goads? What's a goad? A goad's a sharp, pointy stick that the herdsmen used to poke the animals when they were going the wrong way. Or if they wouldn't move, I'm just going to give you a little poke so you get moving. And the more you stood there, the more you got poked. <laughs> Isn't it hard to kick against it? Get away from, get, get that goat away. Just leave me alone, right? He's kicking against the goat and the Holy Spirit is speaking to him, saying this is the thing you need to do. You need to move forward. You need to change your life. You need to address this issue. And some of us have been kicking against the goats for a long, long time. We're, the, we're the, one, the dog in the pack that got hit by the, by the rock. The Holy Spirit struck us and we're still like, okay, I'm just going to try to ignore what you're trying to do in my life. I'm not going to deal with that. But God all the time is saying, listen, if you don't deal with that, you can't move into the promised land. You can't move into the place, your future that I have for you. So he's going to wrestle with Jacob as long as it takes for Jacob. And at the end, Jacob's still not going to give up. He has to touch his hip to cripple him so that he'll finally give up. And then we find Jacob just clinging to God going, please, please just bless me because the greater always bless the lesser. You're the winner. You finally, he's given up. And so he's hanging on to him. And it's at that moment that God says to him, what's your name? What's your name? He says, Jacob. All right, Jacob. Jacob means deceiver. Jacob means heel catcher. Jacob, you've been trying to do everything in your own strength, scheming to figure out your life. And, but now what I'm going to do is rename you Israel. And there's many translations for the name Israel, but I think the best one is this. God prevails. Israel means God prevails. Because God's the one who's going to prevail in your life if you let him. But God had to bring Jacob to a moment of brokenness. Because sometimes we need to wrestle with God to the point where we give up. And finally God's going to make, be able to make the change in our life. And I don't know where you're at today. What is your Esau? What is your Esau? He's at the verge of the Jabbok River. The Jabbok River means emptiness. I put a little thing on the screen here for you of the map where he was at. Hold on. 
He's right here. Right here. And he's going to cross over. And when he crosses this area, he's going to enter in. This is part of the promised land. He's going to enter in. And he's at the verge. He's at the precipice of moving into the new land. To get rid of that emptiness in your life, you need to empty yourself of all of your strength, of all of your scheming, of all of your I can do it without you, God. And he's got to wrestle with God until he's ready to give up and go, okay, God, I want you to take over this area of my life. And when he does that, then God says, okay, now we're ready to move into your future. Some of you are on a verge of a breakthrough right now. But you just need to go that surrender. Go that extra step and go, God, I know this issue in my life and I keep trying to ignore it. Maybe it's time to deal with it today. You don't have to do it in your own strength. You don't have to take on Esau by yourself. God's already promised, I'm with you, I'll help you. Just if you'll stand up, you'll surrender, and you'll start taking on whatever habit it is, whatever attitude it is, whatever forgiveness that needs to take place, whatever thing that God has been pointing to in your life, if you're willing to surrender it, if you're willing to move forward, he'll take on that Esau for you in your life. A.W. Tozer was a theologian. He says, the Lord cannot fully bless a man or a woman until he has first conquered them. See, God needs to conquer us sometimes in whatever it is that we're holding on to. Every man and woman here has to do our own. We all have to do our own wrestling with God. Every single one of us. And I guess the question that we have to walk away with today is, will we surrender to God? Let's pray. God, I don't know what each person here is dealing with. Lord, I'm praying that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you're pointing to something in our own life. Lord, as I wrote this message, before I even walked up here, you were like, this is how it applies to you today, John. Lord, may each and every one of us see what we need to see. Lord, what is your Holy Spirit speaking to us in our hearts? What is the thing you want us to change? What is the thing you want us to take on? What is the thing you want us to surrender, God? Lord, show that to us, and today some of us already know what it is. Lord, Help us to give it to you. Help us to surrender. Lord, to not wrestle you any longer, but to just cling to you and say, give us your blessing. Show us what you want me to do. And to trust that if we go to the front of the procession, that when we face our Esau, you're going to meet us there. We don't have to be at the behind. We don't have to hide behind everything else. But God, we can stand in the front, trusting and believing and standing in your power, not our own. God, would you do that in our lives today? And if we just remain in an attitude of prayer for just a moment, maybe the thing that you've been resisting your whole life is that final giving yourself to God, giving yourself to Jesus Christ. And we say, well, no, I've been a good person all my life. No, no, I've always loved God. You know, in the discipline I grew up, I always knew that Jesus died for the sins of the world. But there came a moment in my life where I said, Jesus, you died for my sins. And there's a difference. There's a difference between knowing who God is. There's a difference between even believing he exists and putting your faith and your trust in him. Because when Jesus came to this earth to die on a cross, he says, I'm dying for your sins. And we receive that by trusting God and receiving his gift. By trusting him that this is true. You see, Jesus died for every sin that you and I will have ever done. And if we try to face God standing on our own strength like Jacob had tried to do, we're going to fall flat on our face. But if we stand before God saying, God, I trusted you. I received Jesus. I confess my sins and I gave it to you. Then he says, I've given you my righteousness and you are mine. You're my child. And if today you've never made that decision to receive Jesus, then I'm going to invite you to do that today. And it's really simple. You just say it. So I'm just going to lead you in a prayer to God, a conversation to God that will help you do that. Let's all pray this together. Dear God, I invite you inside to be my God, my Savior, and my friend. Forgive me of my sins, of all I've done wrong. I've decided today to follow you, Jesus, from this day forever. I'm yours and you're mine. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.